Uh, thanks for coming. Um, this event's called 20 Hertz. It's Cam's music-based lecture series. Uh, my name's Max Fields. I'm the co-organizer of this event tonight featuring Aaron Sines. For his presentation, titled Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Ruining Your Life, Sines will be talking about his experience working in the music industry for bands in Houston and elsewhere. As a fourth generation native Houstonian, Sines has spent the past decade working to foster a supportive community in Houston's music scene. He has booked shows, promoted events, organized record releases for some of Houston's most beloved music groups, managed and coordinated nationwide and international tours, released numerous, numerous albums on his own imprint, and even handled tasks as glamorous as working the venue door, checking IDs, and selling merch for touring bands. Now working and living in Los Angeles, he has continued working for bands based in Houston, all the while adding stacks of paperwork and flooding his email inbox further by signing on to work with A Light in the Attic Records. It's for these reasons that we asked Aaron Sines to, uh, to speak tonight. This, se this series is committed to bringing you, uh, you all um, guests who have a connection with Houston's music culture. I want to thank you again for being here, and we hope to see you guys in, at our upcoming events, um, including our upcoming concert featuring HTRK on March 6th. RSVPs are sold out, um, but you can try. Um, anyways, with, please join me in welcoming Aaron Sines. I, I don't think I've heard my last name that many times since like gym class. That's so awesome. So I'm kind of sick. Imagine that, right? Um, the one time I need to be able to talk and everyone hear me. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for coming. This is really awesome and really exciting to be here. Um, so, like Max mentioned, um, I'm from here and I've lived here pretty much my entire life. Um, most of it I've spent in some way, some fashion, working with bands and musicians. Um, luckily enough, I've been, I've been lucky enough to have so many people trust me with their sort of vision or ideas and kind of what we're going to talk about today or I'm going to talk about and you're going to listen, hopefully. Um, is more or less what I've worked on and most like devoted more m most of my life to. So I started off just doing shows in the city, um, attending shows and going to shows. Um, basically, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm sort of a behind the scenes type of guy. Um, I don't play music. I don't really record records. Um, I don't have a studio, but all along I'm helping bands and people that I'm excited about create some, or attempt to create what their ideal vision is as far as like shows or records or <clears throat> all the things that we've already mentioned. Um, so I started off going to DIY punk shows in the city. Um, I more or less just kind of stumbled upon it um, and immediately was kind of attracted to it and I quickly wanted to have as much, a, a, be involved as much as I could. And that's, that's more or less how I started in the music scene, I guess, or the music scene. Um, some of these are just shows that I did with a lot of my friends. Um, this is kind of how I started, and it kind of evolved quickly into touring with bands and working for other bands, um, most of them based in the city. Um, it eventually evolved into other things, uh, managing bands, putting out records for bands, working at record labels. But <clears throat> all along, this idea of community in the city and promoting bands that I was excited about was really important to me. Um, for Just for being influenced in the things that had happened here before, um, which I quickly learned about from going to shows and buying music. These are just some photos from shows that I was involved with. Um, but more importantly, like the fundamental stuff that I learned from going to shows and putting on events and stuff was really, really helpful for me because unknowns to me, I was gaining all this experience and gaining all this, I guess, knowledge or ideas that I was picking up along the way. I don't really have any sort of formal training in, um, I don't have any sort of formal training in any of this stuff. There's not some class for booking shows or, you know, managing a band. I mean, maybe there is somewhere, but I didn't take it. Um, but so some of these are just 
bands that I've worked for throughout the years and shows that I've worked on. Um, this band specifically, uh, Buxton, I met them when I was 17 and we've had a rapport and worked together in a business sense for since then. You know, I'm 28 now, so I guess, you know, I've known them for 11 years. Um, you know, we've gone through the most insane experiences, um, touring and like ice storms and, you know, losing, losing all of the money that you've made on tour, like any insane story that you could think of. Um, these guys, in addition to the Wild Moccasins, other bands that I've toured with extensively that I've known for a long time, essentially, you know, we've been stuck, almost gone to international prison. We've had birds break in the windshield of our van and ex explode all over us. So unknowns to me, like these are all like experiences that like, you know, I just think they're like horrendous things that are happening, but really they're kind of like prepping you for, or were prepping me for working on a bigger scale for other bands. Um, the past couple of years I spent working with uh, these guys and Kurt Vile and the Violators, and they're kind of like a larger, more well-known band. But this was a breeze compared to like touring in an ice storm or cleaning bird blood all off you in the middle of a highway. You know, all those experiences sort of prepped me for this. And um, so, you know, touring at this level was like, oh yeah, this is no big deal. And it's kind of funny to share these stories now, but in, at the time we're completely, um, you, you know, the worst, thing, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. So, um, but yeah. Um, as Max mentioned, this is a, a reissue label that I work for in Los Angeles. Um, they kind of focus mainly on older music, repackaging records, and bringing light into new projects. Um, I'd spent a long time putting out records for bands that I was excited about, and this, it was kind of an easy transition because, you know, not many people working at labels had experience or put out records on their own. I mean, basically, like, if you think, I was doing, like, medical studies, like, saving money, selling everything I had just to put out records for bands that I was excited about. So to work for somebody else and spend their money to put out records is actually pretty cool, and you don't have to worry about selling a copy. I mean, I know, don't get me wrong, I'm worried about it, but it's a lot different than when you, it's like, either I'm going to put out this record or I'm going to pay my rent. And sometimes I put out the record and then I just paid my rent later, but whatever. Um, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Working at a label after, you know, sacrificing everything, just being so devoted to what I was doing, it, it was more or less an easy transition for me um, and something I wanted to continue to be around. Um, these are just some of the records that the label's known for. This is like a really popular record that everyone, they won an Academy Award for it. Um, Sly Stone. Big Boys reissues. This is iconic Austin punk band that was really influential to me and really cool to get to work with the label that had such, you know, a diversity of artists and a, just a a really a really great vision of what they wanted to be. Um, and I feel like I fit in there, which is great. Um, this guy, who's also reissued on Light in the Attic, is uh, Rocky Erickson. He's a, a psychedelic artist. Um, he's in the band, the 13th Floor Elevators. And these guys, more or less, put out one of the most, if not the most iconic psychedelic record of all time. The 13th Floor Elevators um, are more or less like the beginning of psychedelic music. And this record was actually recorded on Telephone Road in Houston. And it's, you know, things like this that I was always really fascinated by and really proud to be from the city. Like, man, we have such a vast history and such a cool thing here. And not many people know about it. I mean, and that's kind of where I, I would see all this and think, wow, you know, this is definitely something that I want to be a part of and I want to contribute to. And it's just a matter of how, how was I going to do that? And the scene here has been going on since, you know, the early 60s. I mean, before that, but... I guess like underground rock music. Um, these are photos from the 60s, this club called the Catacombs. That it's more or less a teen club and known for psychedelic bands playing there. Um, this photo is actually Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top's first band playing in the 60s. And I was like, oh my God, this is literally the coolest thing ever. How do I become involved in that? And that's more or less how it happened um, as far as my experience and evolving in the city. Um, 
I attribute a lot of it to a lot of people that worked in music and putting on shows and putting out records in the city before me. Um, I was always really fascinated by the things that came before me and really tried to absorb what had happened and really try to share that with people and also spotlight it to a lot of things that people weren't aware of. Um, this is the 13th Floor Elevators record that I mentioned, but there's a series of records from the city that are well known and documented as being hugely influential on a national culture. Um, this is the Billy Gibbons band before ZZ Top, The Moving Sidewalks, um, DRI, a central Houston punk band. So we have all these records in the city that are, you know, transcend genre and are just so iconic in a way. And I was just so thrilled to be a part of this and to think that, like, you know, Towns Van Zandt recorded one of the most amazing live records down the street from my grandmother's house. It's like how, like, it, it was just the coolest thing to me and how I chose to share that, interpret it as much as I could. These are a couple of other records. Yeah. So, I mean, the, it's, it's kind of all over the place when you think about it. You know, there's amazing rap records, iconic punk records, amazing folk records, and it's all happening here. And it was, you know, all this was long gone before, you know, 15-year-old me figured out, like, there's actually something going on here. Um, this is just some other records. Um, but, um, so for me, I was just so happy to, to find this and to stumble upon it. It was just like the greatest thing. Um, really, though, this is kind of, um, what a more Houston cover, right? Good boys. Really, though, um, this is kind of where it changed for me. I got this record um, at like a local record store, and it was the first record I remember. It was like a compilation of bands that were hap actually happening in the city at the time bands that I could go see for the first time. I was like, oh, yeah, this band is playing. I didn't recognize them from this CD. So really, that's kind of when it, it, cha it changed for me. I wasn't just reading about you know, bands that were around a long time ago. And I kind of owe that to you know, places like Vinyl Edge in Spring, huge in the discovery for me for finding music and just for being able to discover this stuff. Um, I can't remember what story about the CD, but I'm sure it was one of these. Um, sound exchange, as far as just like an avant-garde and different perspective on other music that was happening. Because at that point, like, I was just listening to the radio before I discovered all this stuff. And these places were monumental in my discovery for finding music, especially that of like, you know, different type of music or whatever. Um, so sound exchange, cactus, um, it's really funny. I went to middle school down the street from Cactus, um, and on Fridays I would get out of school at one o'clock for some reason, I don't remember, and I would take the bus there and wait there till like five o'clock, and I would, at this time they would let you listen to CDs before, like you could, you could listen to the CD and then buy it if you wanted to, which seems like a totally fucked system, but, so you'd, I would go up there with like this like stack of CDs and I'm like, you know, Jonathan, he works at Cactus, he, he was probably the one opening the CDs and hated me. Um, so I was like, had all these CDs and I was like listening to it. And I sit there for hours just listening to shit. And I was just like thinking about it. You know, this, is, this is how it happened, you know, before the internet. That's what I was doing and that's how I was discovering all this stuff. Um, but, you know, that's the old location. The new one, the new location is kind of a second home for me. Um, a lot of great friends and a lot of great people who work there. And I urge anyone that's never been to any of these places to, you know, check it out. The best way you could become involved in any of this stuff or mildly interested is to buy a record or go to a show or pay to get in. Um, but like I said, these places were monumental in my discovery of music and moving forward. Um, as well as clubs. Um, the scene at that point for me was a couple of clubs downtown where I was, you know, able to go as an underage kid. 
And these aren't like places that you necessarily probably want your kids to go if you're a parent. I mean, you have to think this is like, you know, it, it's pretty raw. There's, you know, toilets overflowing, o open drug deals, underage drinking. But, you know, it's like that energy or whatever that everyone is attracted to. And, and that's what brought, brought me to all this stuff is just these clubs, um, the proletariat, for example. It's like we were booking shows at this place before we were even old enough to drink. And by booking a show, I mean like we were orchestrating, bringing in national touring bands just because we were excited to see them or because we love their music. And that like level of devotion is what kind of sparks a creative community. Um, but like I said, definitely booking shows here before we were even 21. And I mean we is because there's a lot of, I may be the only one up here, but if you look around, there's a lot of owners of what I'm talking about. There's people in bands that are playing, there's people that are recording records, and there's people that are, you know, just excited about what other people are doing, and that's a huge part of it, too. Um, artists who do, you know, posters for shows, people who work on artwork. Like, I may be the one up here, but there's a lot of owners to this, so that's why I keep referring to the we. Um, but the proletariat, for example, the Axiom, I only went there a couple times, but iconic in the sense of like, any like mildly influential or iconic 80s to 90s band played here, like Fugazi, Gigi Allen, and it was in downtown Houston. It, and for me, I was just like, you know, for, I grew up downtown more or less, and I was just like, there is a rock club that was right near my house that all of these bands played. Can you imagine that? And I'm sure it's gonna be like, a condo or something in the next six months but this this level of th this was widely influential on me all of these clubs um and this is like show posters from back then um but that energy that existed and was being ran for kids more or less by kids is kind of that youth that youth culture that i grew up with this is numbers believe it or not yeah, Houston's gym. Yeah, so, I mean, places like this is like, numbers is like, you know, the, the first time, that, you know, the first time for a lot of things, as you can imagine, <laughs> happens in numbers. But it's like such a special place. And as far as like a kid, and I mean kid, like, you know, 16, 17, 18, this is the first time you're hearing bands, you know, like the Smiths or you know, New Order, these are, this is where it's happening. You're like, oh my God, everyone's singing a song, singing along to these songs and everyone just seems so incredibly moved by music. And it was at places like this. Um, this is just a photo of the big boys. Specifically though, Walters on Washington and Mary Jane Fat Cats, for me is kind of where the, the, the game changed, whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, I'll, I'll, I don't think I'll ever have an arrangement or any one of us will have an arrangement like, like we did at Mary Jane's and Fat Cats. Along with being able to book shows here underage at a bar that was 20, that, you know, people paid money to get into. Um, we had probably some of the best experiences with Pam Robinson, who is no longer with us, but the owner of both of these places. Um, had it not been for what was happening in the early 2000s at these places, Mary Jane and Fat Cats, I could, I'd probably easily be an accountant or something. No offense to anyone who's an accountant. I'm just saying, like, I, it's just not for me, you know. Um, it, that was a huge part of, a huge part of my development and discovering bands and being able to host events and be able to just rely on the staff and the, and the scene revolving around these places. Um, a huge... Hu had a huge impact on me. Um, Kate Drew is no longer with us, but I just found out today that it's coming back, apparently. I was waiting for somebody to be like, it is. Was that? Okay. There you go, that's what I wanted, yeah. So yeah, Kate Drew. Um, again, part of the discovery and just helping me be able to orchestrate, like, this music is cool. This is the only place I'm hearing it. This is the only outlet for stuff like this. Um, in addition to, you know, that period of time in the early 2000s. Um, these guys, Hands of Houston, were essentially the curators of, or, and I guess making the soundtrack of 
what was happening in the city, um, at least from, from my point of view. I'm sure there was other people doing cool things. Them specifically was kind of a, a game changer. Game changer. Huh? But essentially, these guys were the model for me as far as like promoting a show, booking a show. And you'd see all of them out at coffee shops or record stores, and you kind of knew who they were, and you knew what was happening around them. These, this is kind of where the model for me as far as promoting a show and running a show and having it be a success is kind of from these early, early models. Um, I feel really lucky to have been able to go to a lot of these events, and, as well as other things in the city that were happening. But specifically, this always kind of stands out to me as I was just like addicted almost. I was like, oh my god, these guys are doing, and women also, sorry, um, were doing the most amazing stuff. And it was something that I really wanted to be a part of. And I feel like, I know, I, like I mentioned, I don't live here um, anymore, but this, the culture and the scene here is something that is so important to me in the sense of that it had such a huge impact on my, on my life that, and I can see it now through the bands that exist in the city. Um, there's a ton of contemporary bands that are more or less contributing to the stuff that I feel is the same sort of, it's the same substance. This like cultural community of bands, and artists, and musicians, and things that I find extremely important, they continue to live here. And more or less, that's, that's like the best part about it for me is that I feel like it's not totally lost. It's, you know, there is this second wave or third wave or fourth wave of things that have been happening since the 60s. And like I mentioned, it's all with people that I really care about and feel extremely lucky to call friends and peers within the, within the scene. Um, all this stuff is, like I said, extremely important to me and really had an impact on my life. I've devoted a majority of my life into making all of these, or anything that I've been a part of successful for the city, simply for the fact that it, it's important to me. What happens here is important to me, and I think it will continue to be. Um, but yeah, th these are just some of the records of modern bands. And if you didn't recognize any of them, you know, I urge you to check them out. Um, but yeah, more or less. Yeah, that's it. I just want to say thanks to the camp for having me. I'm a really lucky guy to have so many people in the room that care about me I can call by first name, so thanks so much for coming. Um, sorry I'm kind of sick and I don't know if it was hard to hear, but I can do it again. No, I'm just kidding. I won't. Oh yeah, what you got? Oh man, they're still messy. Oh, I mean, that's a great question. I'm probably just w what you're aware of. My first show, I can't really remember what it is. It's probably something to do with like me and my brother and some other friends. Um, but it, it's more or less, I would say, like just your confidence in what you're doing over time, your repetition of it. I mean, it, I'm probably not as afraid anymore. I don't. I know that I can handle it, but over the past couple of years, it, it, we've de I've definitely worked on stuff that it grows every year. You know, I'm like, man, this festival with 2,000 people, and now it's 10,000 people. Again, there's no sort of formal training. It's just by doing so, and trial and error. And I have a ton of errors, so it's that's really more or less how it happened, or the difference, I should say. If anybody else has a question, I'll answer a couple questions. Cool. What's up? What's good or what's going on? 
oh man, you know, the local bands suck compared to Houston bands. I'll tell you what. I mean, no, I'm uh, no just to any LA bands that are in the room. But I mean, I would say there's a lot of people. I mean, it, it's what you think it is. There's a lot of people who think they're going to get signed. There's a lot of bands who are like showcase type bands. There's some cool bands, but yeah, like I said, I mean, Houston bands definitely take the cake. So. All right. What you got? Oh, man. Jeez. Fuck, you really want to know about LA? <laughs> um, okay, I will say this. It, it is kind of strange. I feel like here, as a Houstonian, um, I'll use the term grind. You have to really grind to make stuff happen. This is a really tough place to get people to show up, pay, not complain, have a good time, and then tell their friends about it. It's like a domino effect. That's actually a really good question now that I'm thinking about it. Um, so in LA, it's like this like, you know, water slide where you just like hop in and there's so many people that are there to make sure your time is good and great. And you kind of just like roll on it. Um, here, you have to work the door yourself, and hope the sound guy shows up. You know, per if you want something to go, well, really promote it um, and really be behind something. And that's kind of the obvious difference is like, Los Angeles is definitely a place that people, the avenues are there. You know, there's major radio that plays music that isn't played on the radio anywhere else. Um, there's a ton of record stores. And at, for a city the size of Houston, we have a fair amount of record stores, but that's, all these things, they really matter. Um, record stores, radio, having some sort of like outlet, other creative people, instead of just, you know, this, there's just more people, and that has a lot to do with it too. But yeah, no, that was a great question. What you got? You can go. Yeah, go. Oh, yeah, the table. Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of the stuff I talked about here is in physical form over there. But don't take any, because they belong to me. <laughs> What's up? Oh, yeah, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, know. They're all records that were recorded here, or bands that are from here. So, yeah. No, it's cool. All right, cool. What's up? Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's physically possible. You know, the city's so spread out. You know, we have a, a great population of people that there is money here to put towards creative things. But I think just, you know, I, I've always wondered that, what the problem was. And I mean problem is that, like, the music culture here isn't very vast. Um, it's kind of like 100 to 200 people contributing. And I would say the start would be to get other people involved invite people to shows and just not rely on the normal avenues that you always, do. you know, instead of just like promoting something on social media, you know, you could really go out of your way to invite people. I think you, absorbing as many resources as you could probably be the best. You know, that's, that's a good question. So. Okay, well, if anybody has any more questions, I'll stop. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks again to the cam. Special thanks to Daniel and Max. Yeah.